So we have the rest of this Thunderfoot video to get through and one after, so let's get back into it. For people who haven't seen part one, the link is in the description box, as is the link to the playlist for this entire series. Please watch before commenting, and please don't pretend that this is the only video in the series, because otherwise, what do you think you'll achieve? I really don't get that. Video after video after video, day after day after day, someone comments with something they think is a big knockdown point that's something we've already covered. And even when pressed, they insist we didn't cover it when we absolutely did. You people keep doing it and it makes no sense. So just knock it off already, okay? Anyway, back to Thunderfoot's video. Look, the real technical challenges are making a vacuum tube of this size. No, Thunderfoot, because this scales. Each pump only has to do a section of the track, and as we showed, you don't need anywhere near as many of them as you keep claiming, mostly because you keep comparing the difficulty of maintaining a 100 pascal pressure to that of maintaining a 1 micropascal pressure, and therefore you keep being off by 8 orders of magnitude. And even at that, that does nothing to address all the expansion and seal problems that you will have on that. We address these, Thunderfoot. You're only making yourself look like an even bigger moron than you were before. What is it about the idea of a 300 meter long telescoping section next to the platform that Thunderfoot finds so ridiculous? Energy goes with the velocity squared. And now you've got a capsule that's going to weigh 10, 20 tons or something, even the slightest problem with that, and it will absolutely destroy the entire Hyperloop system. You keep claiming this, Thunderfoot, but every time you've given any specifics as to why this would be, you've ended up being completely, utterly, stupidly, and embarrassingly wrong. Hell, let's just say a loose bolt is thrown up by the track somewhere. The Hyperloop was not invented by Elon Musk. A 15 ton capsule, basically traveling at the speed of sound, has about the same energy as about two tons of TNT. Have you ever seen what happens to a tanker truck when it's pumped out under vacuum? Any slight dent in that wafer thin tube and you would be looking at a cascade failure. Yes, folks, he's just repeating himself. He has nothing new to offer. And these are all things we have debunked previously in this series. We have shown him to be absolutely, totally, and laughably wrong, and he has no response to it. Here's another example. And yes, it is a vacuum chamber. One thousandth of an atmosphere might not quite be deep space levels, but it's more than enough to make frogs explode. See, he still doesn't know when you should look at a pressure differential linearly and when you should look at it logarithmically. That's why his figures keep being off by several orders of magnitude. Because so far, none of the tubes that they've created have dealt with the expansion issue in any way whatsoever. <sighs> look, Thunderfoot, no one is saying that these tests have dealt with every single issue that will be encountered on the way to making this thing a reality. In fact, they know they haven't, which is why the next step is more tests on longer tracks and not a finished product. But you yourself said it. You can't test these things on such a small stretch of tracks, so what is the big issue about waiting for the bigger tracks to examine them? Once again, Thunderfoot doesn't have the first clue how engineering research and development is done. But he pretends to be oh so much smarter than numerous engineers, some of them among the best in their field, at multiple different companies. This, folks, is the Dunning-Kruger effect in action, which is also in display in his next Hyperloop video. Now, I don't know what it is about the Hyperloop, but boy, does some of these people want to believe. Just like you desperately want to disbelieve, to the point where you'll warp every single principle of physics, engineering, and even geometry to do it. Now let me start with a correction. Ooh, a correction! This is good! Is he finally going to acknowledge that he should have been looking at pressure logarithmically? Is he going to acknowledge how easily the Hyperloop can break to a halt, and how he was wrong in chastising these tests for stopping so quickly? Is he finally going to acknowledge the square cube law, a basic principle of geometry, and how it invalidates his vacuum tests? So I accidentally put in the velocity in terms of kilometers per hour rather than meters per second, rather than putting in 
300 meters per second, I actually put in a thousand there. And of course, things that squared, that means that the final energy comes out off by about a factor of 10, an order of magnitude. So I guess all the Hyperloop groupies can dance a little jig that Thunderfoot made a mistake. The amazing thing isn't that you made a mistake, Thunderfoot. It's that it took you this long to acknowledge even one of them. But thanks for acknowledging that the power requirements would only cost 50 cents instead of $5. Now, there are times when an order of magnitude makes the world of difference. Like if I was claiming that I lost 50 kilograms on my diet rather than only losing five. Or if you said that a breach would cause a physics-defying one atmosphere wall of air rushing in at the speed of sound due to calculations that were off by five orders of magnitude because you failed to account for the square cube law. Or if you compared the difficulty of pumping the Hyperloop down to 100 pascals by looking at the requirements to reduce the pressure to 1 micropascal, making you off by 8 orders of magnitude. Or if you said that it would require a compressor running 10 times faster than that of a commercial jet, when in reality you'd only need it running at about a third of a typical jet compressor. Yes, Thunderfoot, there are times when errors like that are really important. Not to mention embarrassing. Like if, say, you were to call something a turbomolecular pump when it's really a compressor, or if you were to get the forward compressor confused with the nozzle expander. Yeah, that'd be really moronic if you did that. If anything goes wrong, you will be turned into a red mist or chunky salsa or whatever. Choose your metaphor. Now, let's imagine it's not just being shot by a bullet, but your entire weight being shot against a wall. And yeah, the wall you're traveling in is within centimeters of the capsule. Yes, that's another great example of an idiotic thing you keep saying. Now you're getting the idea. Oh, wait, you were being serious again. <sighs> Either way, if anything goes wrong, you're out of luck. Thunderfoot, are you ever going to respond to the numerous times that we and others have shown you how pathetically wrong you were on every single scenario you had for a Hyperloop disaster? But couldn't you say the same for an airplane? Well, kind of, but planes don't typically fly within a few centimeters of something that isn't. You know, they don't fly supersonic within centimeters of the ground. We're still waiting for you to explain how a pod propelled by linear induction motors is supposed to crash into the very tube that those motors run along. Isn't this a bit like saying that a train might crash into the track it's running on? Further, there's no immediate hazard of, say, loose bolts or something being thrown up from the track at 30,000 feet. Thunderfoot, you still haven't said anything about where these mysterious loose bolts are supposed to be coming from, or how they're supposed to just fly up in front of the pod because reasons. And we challenged you on that several videos ago. We also pointed out how airplanes have to worry about the serious and very real possibility of a bird strike, something you're still keen to blissfully ignore. Even breathing pure oxygen at 1 20th of an atmosphere, you're only getting one quarter of the oxygen that you would at sea level. However, the Hyperloop doesn't run at 1 20th of an atmosphere, but 1,000th of an atmosphere meaning that a depressurization event would be more like a rupture in a spacecraft or something. Now, see, Thunderfoot, this is why you shouldn't have claimed to have read the Alpha document, because it lets us know for sure that you're a liar. They go into detail about depressurization events, and here you are, once again, pretending like they haven't even considered it. We went into depressurization, the Armstrong limit, and how quickly and easily you can repressurize the tube in the event of an emergency. Once again, you have ignored all of this to rely on nothing more than your own personal incredulity. Of course, he'll also turn on a dime and say that the problem with the Hyperloop is that it repressurizes too quickly if there's a breach, that remonstrable bullet being fired from a gun. That's like claiming, shortly after the invention of the rocket, that we'll all be traveling by rocket ship in five years' time. Um, Thunderfoot, you should be made aware that someone posting on your channel and using your same pompous, egotistical, self-important voice keeps saying that the Hyperloop isn't a new idea and is something people have been proposing for a century. But now it's a brand new idea all of a sudden, not an old idea where the technology happens to have progressed to the point where it can be made feasibly. Once again, 
Thunderfoot keeps stabbing pathetically at the Hyperloop with a Morton's fork made of rubber, thinking he's David taking down the mighty Goliath when he hasn't even made a mark on it. Stay strong and be free.